Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me. And he said to me, you are my servant. Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in his womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him? For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivals of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations and my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the redeemer of Israel and his holy one to one deeply despised and abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This ends our reading. Our gospel lesson comes to us from the gospel according to John. John is different than the other gospels. John does not have a explanation about what happened during the baptism but instead afterwards, the next day. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and John declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes one who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came, baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water had said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen, and I have testified, this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came. And they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was already about the four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Anointed One. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The day after that, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. He said to him, Truly, truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God 
ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So end our lessons for this day. I've been in the pastoral ministry now for 33 years, as long as Mario has been alive. (laughs) That's not a statement about how old I am, but how young he is. What it means is I can remember the voice of Dr. King, those deep bass tones declaring that he had a dream, that one day all might be equal. I remember when that preacher's kid was a pastor in Atlanta, and he decided that that wasn't enough, that he was called to something more. We celebrate his memory. We celebrate his birthday. But we dare not forget that he was called to be and to do something far more, to change expectations and hopes and dreams. Having grown up going to Sunday school, I thought I had learned every lesson and went off to college and learned the lessons there and then to seminary and then for doctoral work and then began to teach. And finally, about five years ago, we tried something we'd never done before. We threw out all the lesson plans and began on Wednesday evenings reading the Bible together and listening to each other, not to teach, intentionally not to take over the class, not to quote to them what Jerome had said in the second century or what Martin Luther King Jr. said in 1960 or what Reinhold Niebuhr had said in the 50s. Those were important. But what's far more important is what you think about what you hear and what difference it makes to you in the living of life. It's a wonderful way to read the Bible because anybody, whether you're two years old or 22 or 82 or 102, all of us see life differently. All of us read the Bible and hear things differently. Second, because as eloquent as Shakespeare may have been, as great a following as Robert Schuller or Billy Graham had, your opinion matters. What's going on in your life, your thinking, matters. And the Bible speaks to each of us differently. But third, and one I hadn't appreciated until recently about that exercise, is that it's training us, teaching each of us, not only with the Bible, but with life. To wonder what you see here. To come along and question and wonder. So I've got an assignment for you. Before next week, every night, each night as you prepare to go to bed, once you've gotten ready, once you've counted off all the things that have happened that day and sorted them out so that you can rest your mind to go to sleep, that you would try to imagine, where did you see the holy this day? Where did you find God's grace? What were the blessings that you received? As children, we were taught to kneel by our bedside, to fold our hands and close our eyes, and to name our blessings. And as adults, we often don't do that. To stop and to see where was Christ in our lives this day? In the Bible, there's a question being asked over and over again here by Jesus. What are you searching for? What matters in your life? I'm convinced that the greatest theological times will not come between 9.30 and 10.30 on Sunday morning from the pulpit, but that each of you in your own lives, maybe it's in the choir singing, Maybe it's in a child who's speaking to you during the service. Maybe it's in the light coming through the windows. Maybe it's something at work or at home. But there are those times that call us to be far more than what we have been before, to consider life differently. The Gospel of John is different than any of the other Gospels. Mark begins by saying to the demons and the evil spirits, silence, be quiet, be still. Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus, explaining how he is descended from Abraham 
and from David down through to today, and then describes how Jesus went up the mountainside and preached to 5,000 people and fed them. Luke goes back to Isaiah and describes how John the Baptist was like Isaiah, proclaiming that the acceptable year of the Lord is here. This, this is a blessed day in your life. For on this day, the prisons will be opened and all the prisoners will be released and miracles will happen in your midst. But John is different. John begins at Genesis. John is all about transformation, about recognizing that the ways in which we have lived our lives are good, but that's not enough. You are called to something greater. So it is that John describes in the beginning that Christ was there and nobody noticed him. All throughout our lives, Christ has been there. All throughout history, long before Jesus was born at Bethlehem, the Spirit of Christ has been in our midst and none of us recognized him. And John calls us to question why and what we're looking for, what we're searching for, and whether it satisfies. I love John the Baptist in his way of preaching, not simply for the eloquence of his words, not because he attracted great numbers, not because he was so pastoral, but because throughout he continually said, it ain't me. I'm not God. I'm not Christ. I'm not the one who is to come. I'm not Elijah. I'm not a prophet. I'm simply sent here to baptize and call you. But John also named Jesus the Lamb of God. It's a strange title that only occurs here because all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Israelites, they never sacrificed a male lamb for a sin offering. You would sacrifice a heifer, a cow. You would sacrifice two turtle doves. You'd sacrifice a burnt offering of grain for sin offerings to atone for what you'd done wrong. But a male lamb, that would never be sacrificed for our sins. A female sheep was often sacrificed for thanksgiving. It was so bountiful to realize all the great blessings that we have that we would sacrifice a whole burnt offering of a sheep. But a male lamb, it only occurs twice in the Old Testament. First, with Abraham, when he goes up the mountain with Isaac to prove to himself and to God that he's going to be loyal to the covenant. Even though the covenant's already been fulfilled, even though he already has all the blessings he wants, he will still be faithful and do what God commands, sacrificing his son. And just as he's about to do so, Abraham sees a ram, a male sheep, about a year old, caught in the thicket. And hears from God that this sacrifice should happen for his son instead. And the wonder of that passage is we're never clear as to whether the son is Isaac or whether the son is the son of God. And later, with Moses at the Passover, when the Hebrew people are enslaved and oppressed and have had everything done to them, they cry out to God, and God tells them to take a lamb, a male, unblemished, about a year old, and take it into your home and treat it as a family member. Feed it from your table. Let it sleep with your children. And then after two weeks, that becomes the sacrifice to let God know that you've already sacrificed for all the nation. A male lamb, Jesus, doesn't fit as a sacrifice for our sins, but instead is a gift of grace from God for all that we have endured for all that God wants for us. It's a calling to live life in the covenant anew. It's as if everything that happened in the Old Testament is embodied in Jesus. So for John, it's you're the son of God. For Nathaniel, it's you're the king of Israel, a son of David. Each one finds something different that they call upon him. It's a recognition that in our lives, there are traumas that happen. When we wake up one morning and our spouse is gone, when we have a stroke, when we lose our job, 
when suddenly our legs don't work. Things happen to us. And at those times, it's easy for us to hunker down, to seek survival, and to try to blot out everything else around us, to only focus on getting by. Folks, 9-11 happened 15, almost 16 years ago. How long will we stay in survival mode? How long until we lift up what is truly important to us and respond to the calling? If we're concerned about race, that we would seek out others and challenge one another, not to allow those jokes to go by unchallenged, but to live our lives accepting of each other, listening to one another. According to John, two of the disciples followed after Jesus. In fictional writing, details are important. It's one thing when an author describes for us, he was driving down the road. It's another. When they're describing, I was going up 321, turning onto Route 5, accelerating because I was getting on to 690, headed into the city, and staring into the sun as I drove. You know exactly where you are. You know the authenticity of the author, that they know this place and what was going on and what time of day it is. So it is in John's Gospel. He describes that it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday. And they catch up with Jesus, and Jesus turns to them. And Jesus doesn't say, what do you want? Instead, Jesus says, what are you seeking? What are you seeking in life? Happiness? Fulfillment? Challenge? Opportunity? What are you seeking in life? And they respond it's translated poorly in English, where are you staying? That's not what it's about. It's who are you? Where's your home? What identifies who you are so that we can find you again and we can be with you again? Because this is precious. And Jesus doesn't say, I'm the Savior. I'm the Son of God. I'm your rabbi. Instead says, come and see. I remember 20 years ago, meeting with the nominating committee of this church, and they asked for a great plan of what we were going to take on. And together we said, we're going to take it one day at a time. And we're going to see. But it's not simply going to be about worship and education and fellowship, but instead, when challenges arise, responding to those challenges. Immediately, before sunset, Andrew went and found his brother and said to him, come and see. You've got to meet this one. We found the Lord. And they come. Four o'clock on a Friday afternoon doesn't mean a great deal to us. Maybe it's happy hour. In that time, for that people, it was a signal that Sabbath is about to begin. And you can't leave. You can't walk anywhere. You've got to stay where you are. So by Jesus saying, come and see, he was inviting them to stay with him to celebrate the Sabbath, to spend the night, to break bread together, to truly be part of his inner circle. We, each of us, have known marriages that have been stuck. We've known friends who are taking life as it comes, simply living out their days. Life is far too precious. The expectations of the world are far too great. You are precious. You are blessed because God needs you. God has called you to a purpose, to reach out to others, to find the lost, to say what no one else will say, to listen to them. This week, I encourage you, and in the weeks to follow, to stop each day and realize how blessed you are. And then, what are you going to do with those blessings? God's known you since before you were born, like a polished arrow in God's quiver. But just to survive, that's not enough. God has a great purpose for you. <laughs>